Hello and welcome to my first video of the year 2021, a year that is more or less already in the shitter. But forget all that, I hope you're ready for a good dose of video game escapism because it's time for volume 3 of Japan only PS1 games, the series where we dive into the never ending pool of weird and wonderful games that you've probably never heard of. If you've watched previous volumes you know what we do next but if you're new to the series let's quickly get you up to speed. Using a YouTube channel called the Virtual Gaming Library, I aim to watch 10 seconds of footage from every single PlayStation game. Anytime a Japanese exclusive game showed up, I put it down on a list. Text heavy games are unfortunately excluded from the list due to the language barrier, but in rare cases where there's a translation guide or the game just looks too cool to ignore, then they'll make it on the list too. We've got tons of different games covering a wide variety of genres, but how do we decide which games to play? Well, we're gonna leave that up to chance. From here we take every single game we've jotted down and then add them to a list randomizer. Once we randomize the list we then take the top 100 games and add them into a big spinning prize wheel. We're then going to spin the wheel 3 times and whatever 3 games we land on those are the games we'll be looking at in today's episode. With that brief explanation out of the way let's not waste any more time. The list grows longer, the games are getting weirder but still as always the wheel will provide. <laughs> will provide Volume Tree's first game is Gunbari, Game Tengoku The Game Paradise 2, developed and published by Jalco and released on the PlayStation in 1998. Shoot'em ups, we know them, we love them, but sometimes spaceships are just too serious, right? Sometimes we need to kick back, unwind, and just look at some dumb stuff while blasting away. Well, ever since Konami taught to themselves one day, okay, Gradius is good, but what if it had a penguin? Well, a subgenre was born that day, the parody shooter. And today's game is one of these. Now, you may have noticed this game is called The Game Paradise 2, and yes, this is a follow-up to the first game which was originally released in arcades before being ported to the Saturn in Japan. No PS1 release for this game, unfortunately. But this game, in spite of it being a Japan-only release in a pretty niche genre, has made enough of a buzz for itself over the years to be recently released on modern platforms in the West. And that's because The Game Paradise 1 also happens to be really, really good. The game Paradise 2 on the other hand has not yet seen any ports and was a PS1 exclusive made ground up for the hardware. But what makes it different from its predecessor and more importantly, is it any good? Well, let's find out. Starting off the game we're greeted to a nice anime opening that introduces us to the game's cast of characters and there's a lot of them. This game apparently uses characters from past Jalico games and a lot of these are older Japanese exclusive arcade titles so for the life of me, I don't know who any of these are, but that's not really important. All I need to know is that I can play as a pig, and a car, and that's me sold on the roster immediately. So the game Paradise 2's big gimmick is that it likes to reference video games and otaku culture within its levels. One stage you could be fighting through an arcade taking on various different pieces of hardware. The next will see you starting out in a bedroom before you get sucked into the TV and then find yourself in a military tactics game before then moving on to a horror visual novel. Keep in mind the entire time this is still a shoot 'em up. It's a very, very nerdy game full of little details made to impress nerds and I gotta tell you it's working as designed. We have a level dedicated to vector graphics with some Xevious and Darius references, a Tamagotchi boss fight, a racing stage which works a little better than it probably should and also features lots of legs. You know if you're into legs. And of course we can't forget fighting through a PC operating system before logging into a boss's website so you can fight him. It's hard not to crack a smile seeing some of this stuff for the first time. 
So now that you know what to expect from the game, how does it play? Well, we have a standard vertical setup here. Each character has access to three different attacks, a standard shot attack which can be charged to unleash a stronger variant, a homing attack that requires you to lock on the enemies using a little target in front of your ship, and a handy bomb useful for dishing out or avoiding damage in a pinch. Enemies can appear on multiple planes, and while most enemies can be hit using your standard attacks, certain enemies can only be hit using your homing attack depending on their position on screen. It's relatively simple and doesn't take too long to get used to, thankfully. What types of weapons you're going to use, how fast your ship moves, all of this is determined by the character that you choose. So it's generally in your favour to find a character that fits your preferred playstyle, since there's no option for customization here. If you like a character's weapons but find their movement speed too slow, unfortunately there's not much you can do about that, but I imagine everybody will find a happy medium to help get them through the game. Once I found a character that I liked, I ended up gelling with the gameplay pretty quickly, but the game overall has quite a few odd choices that I think are worth highlighting. The first is that the game lets you choose from any of the game's five stages upon starting, with the final sixth stage unlocking once you've completed the previous five in any order. Now you're probably asking what's wrong with being able to pick your stage order. Thunder Force, a great game, does this. And yes, it does. And yes, it is great, but things are a little different here. What happens is that if you pick a stage, play through it and beat it, you're then popped back to the main menu. Meaning that from what I can tell, there is actually no way to play all of the game's stages in one continuous run. You play the level, you get your score, and then you just go back and pick the next one. It's a strange thing to omit, and I know for shoot'em up fans who like to beat games in a single credit and aim for massive high scores, well that's just something you can't really do here. And I thought this might be down to user error because there is a lot of Japanese text here in the menus, enough to seem a little overwhelming, but nope, I do think there's just the normal mode where you select levels and a time attack mode, which is kind of the same thing. It's just a bit weird. And honestly, I think this hurts the game's flow and the levels too, because the individual stages vary pretty wildly in quality. Some feature multiple areas and lots of enemies to fight, some only last barely 3 minutes with very little going on throughout that runtime. They wouldn't seem too bad if they all flowed from one another, but you've got to load out, go to the high score menu, select the next level, select your character again, and then load into the next, very short level. And these menus have a lot of cutesy Japanese dialogue on each button press that you have to wait through as well, which makes navigating menus a much more arduous process than it really needs to be. <laughs> So in all, the game's 6 levels don't take very long to beat at all, and I did find them fun my first time through, but what is there to keep you coming back? Well other than the wide variety of characters, there is an upgrade system too. In levels you can collect eggplants to up your score, and after a level you can purchase permanent upgrades for your ships, either increasing your life count or your ship's power. Now these upgrades are exclusive to one ship, not universal, so remember when I said it pays to find a ship you like and stick with it? This is what I meant. Even still, this system is a little flawed. I found fully upgraded ships were way too overpowered in some cases, and worst of all, there's no real visual changes to your weapons when powering them up. A level 1 laser looks the same as a level 8 laser. The damage is different, but half the fun is getting that visual feedback of your ship improving. It's something you don't really think about until it's gone, but it's so rare not to see this basic implementation, it's just kind of puzzling. The whole game is kind of puzzling. It's a really cool concept and has some great sections during levels, but the moment to moment gameplay is just lacking in a lot of ways. Combat is functional but bland, weapons are powerful but they don't feel or look powerful, I'd say half the characters are just outright not fun to play as, the levels are very short and compared to the first game, this one just feels like a downgrade in so many ways. I really just wish they might have cut down on the number of characters and maybe fleshed out the gameplay and levels a little bit more. In fact, probably the game's most puzzling addition and one of the weirdest gimmicks in any shoot'em up is that a second player can actually join in the action by connecting a light gun and just shooting enemies on the screen while you play. In fact, if you wanted to, you could even attempt to play this game with a controller in one hand and a light gun in the other, just dual blasting your way into game paradise. Now unfortunately, I can't try this implementation myself due to a lack of a light gun, but good news, somebody has. And it looks... Well, I mean, do you think you could play this well as the spaceship with the screen flashing constantly? Yeah, probably not. A really quirky novelty gimmick, but once again, just another gimmick in a game that could use a little more substance at its core. 
The game at least still looks pretty nice. It really does depend on how you feel about blocky polygonal 3D shooters, and it certainly has aged much worse than its predecessor's 2D look, but I still think it looks good at times, and it can really nail the look of the games it's trying to parody at the same time. Music is thankfully also pretty good. It's a little inconsistent, plenty of unmemorable tracks, but some really good ones as well. The character select screen music, especially, is an absolute bop. <laughs> Gunbarra Game Tengoku The Game Paradise 2 is a game I really wanted to like more. It's a great concept, it's full of gamer and otaku fan service, and is genuinely very funny and clever at times. But it's a game that features a bit too much excess to make up for the lackluster game behind it all. At the end of the day, all the fun gimmicks and characters in the world won't make up for a dull core experience, and unfortunately that's kinda what we have here. There's still some fun to be had, and in spite of the large amount of Japanese in the menus, it's still relatively import friendly. But given there's a better and more accessible predecessor to this game available to purchase right now on modern hardware, I'd have to suggest that you just try that one first given the choice. Unless you really gotta try that light gun mode, although god help your eyes if you do. <laughs> Next up we have Engacho, developed and published by Nihon Application Co and released on the PlayStation in the year 1999. One of the game's biggest features is that it has a flying arse. Less importantly though, there is a game behind it all too, so let's check that out. Engacho basically means icky or disgusting. Whenever a Japanese kid would come into contact with something disgusting, you can supposedly cleanse yourself of the filth by creating a circle with your hands and then having somebody make a cutting action to cut through it. This gesture is called Engacho, or at least that's what the internet tells me. It is in Spirited Away, so there you go, it's probably real. So with a name like Engacho, you kinda get a vibe of what this game's all about. It's icky. There is a loose story here in Engacho. You play as this young boy who supposedly wants to prove to his father that he's not a coward. Although it looks to me like this very angry father might have banished his son into the filth world to fight against disgusting monsters. I see parallels with the Binding of Isaac here, I'm not gonna lie. In the filth world, you'll face off against five different monsters, known collectively as the Ups 5 group. Look, there's a, a lot going on with these guys. The designs kind of remind me of Ah Real Monsters a little, only instead of the lovable monsters from a classic kid show, these guys instill me with a powerful sense of dread. I assume these monsters have names, but I couldn't find out what they are, so to make things easier, I've named them all for your convenience. Here we have Sex Pest, this is Snotzer, this is Armpits, our Lord and Saviour, Flying Butt, and of course, everybody's favourite, Bag. Well, that's the Ups 5, so what kind of game features these monstrosities? Well, it's a puzzle game, of course. The gameplay for Ngacho is very simple. From an isometric angle, you control your character on a board. You can move one space at a time in one of four directions. Boards will also feature some of the five monsters. Monsters also move one space at a time directly after you move, although the direction that the monster moves is determined by the direction that you move yourself. So for example, some monsters will move the same direction that you do, others might go the complete opposite direction, others a completely different direction again. 
The entire gimmick of this game is planning out your moves and trying to manipulate and control the movement of the monsters, while also navigating around yourself. Some of the game modes require you to navigate around a board to reach a goal, and other modes may have you combating a CPU or second player until one of you eventually succumbs to them. It's a very simple game that's easy to pick up and play, but it does offer some real depth between the different modes, with plenty of levels and challenges to take on. Thankfully the game features a pretty robust training mode which does offer you multiple stages exclusive to each monster type, which will help teach you the unique patterns for each monster, as well as getting you used to the challenges that await you later in the story and battle modes. Story is the main single player content with over 100 individual stages that will have you scratching your head within seconds of starting. This can be a pretty tough game with some levels featuring multiple monsters to keep track of and it requiring a lot of trial and error since you can get trapped or go over the step limit for a level. But thankfully resetting a level and starting again is almost instant so it's easy to try again without wasting too much time. And when you do eventually beat a level, they can actually only take a couple of seconds once you know the right path to take. So each level is bite sized enough not to feel dull or taxing even after 10 or 20 retries. If you prefer something more competitive over a straight up puzzle mode, you can take on the AI in a series of different challenges, which sees you fighting your dad to essentially manipulate monsters into reaching him first. Almost like some sort of disgusting version of chess. Once again, it can be pretty tough, but levels are still short and can be retried almost instantly. This mode also features some animations for each of the monsters when they reach a player character, and uh... <laughs> You know, I'd probably call Japan weird for creating this stuff, but the West also gave us Boogerman and a turd that sings opera tunes, so we're not really much better, are we? You can of course play this game against the second player if you like, so I once again tried asking my girlfriend if she wanted to play it with me. Come on Orla, there's a flying arse in it. I'm not playing the f***ing game. She wasn't really into it. At least you can admire the nice stadium while the second player stands still for eternity. Look at that little dragon, what's he up to? I suppose that's as good a segue as any to talk about the visuals, and I mean, they're nice if a little basic. The sprites look pretty good and they certainly have a lot of personality, although the personality might not be to everybody's taste. The board and backgrounds do update from zone to zone, but it's generally just an unexciting background or tile swap and you will see a lot of the same location before you eventually pass the 20 levels needed to see the next. The music and sound design is fun though, assuming you like the sound of being pooped on, or whatever this is. Background music for the levels is nice though, nothing spectacular, but it is catchy and fitting for the game. The opening team, on the other hand, slaps pretty hard though. That's pretty much it for Engacho, a simple but engaging puzzle game that you'll likely really enjoy if you like brain teasers or making your friends feel really uncomfortable. The character designs and disgusting themes might not be to everybody's taste, but there is a ton of content here and it is also very import friendly. So if you want to navigate around monsters in the weird dungeons in your dad's house, Engacho on the PS1 has got you covered. It's also available on the Wonderswan as well, which might even be the better version since this kind of game feels nicely suited to portable play. Either way, you can't really go wrong. Wheel will provide. Nanika. 
いるラストゲームフィーチャーのボリューム3 is Blade Arts。released in September of the year 2000 and developed by a company I've never heard of before。EA。Don't worry, the A is lowercase, so you know they are not somebody else。This game was published by Enix though, who are a little more high profile, mostly well known for all those other great JRPGs, as well as eventually making Squaresoft a little less soft。Blade Art is an action adventure game. It's kind of like a Japanese Tomb Raider that's also a hack and slash. That probably sounds appealing to a lot of you, and that's because it is. I like hacking up spiders in tombs with big swords. What can I say? It's a character trait. Blade Art is very much its own thing, though. For one, the game has a ton of story and voice, giving it an almost cinematic feel at times. Well, at least as far as PS1 games go. Think a few steps below Metal Gear Solid, and you, you'll know what I mean. And when I said a ton, I meant a ton. I would say that during the first two hours of gameplay, maybe 45 minutes of that were cutscenes. Now, I always do find it impressive whenever PS1 games attempt to go for long, more complex narratives that are fully voiced, and a lot of the cutscenes are also done within the game's own engine. But if you can't speak the language, you're going to be spending a lot of time not knowing what the hell is going on. And all of the cutscenes are unskippable too, by the way. So. I mean, you try to make sense of the talking panther scene without context. So, yeah, to say I had no idea what was going on during my time with this game is a bit of an understatement. It's obviously not a fault on the game itself, this is what we call a me problem. But if you can't read Japanese, you're missing out on a big part of the game and a time consuming part at that. Now, normally I would look online to see if people have fleshed out or translated anything online, but. Info on this game in English is very scarce. Surprisingly so. It doesn't even have a Moby Games page. That's how you know things are bad. Thankfully, the ever reliable PSX Data Center has the only English story summary I could find online. So, what's Blade Arts even about? Set on a mysterious volcanic island where a team of scientists have disappeared, you must get involved and wield the massive fantasy style weaponry of truly epic proportions to restore order and find out a few home truths. Blade Arts is a fantasy adventure with lots and lots of combat where players take on the role of a hero who often finds himself battling several vicious enemies at once. Focused on fast, non stop hack and slash action, Blade Arts follows a developed storyline and cinematic cutscenes to help move the plot, along with a third person fighting perspective and a lock on targeting system that allows players to concentrate on dealing out as much damage as possible. Okay, that sounds about right. On the other hand, there is also a Google translated version of the official manufactured description, which reads Mysterious Ancient Ruin Salem, an adventure set in a treaty action adventure. Cut down the enemy, a sense of exhilaration, a sense of accomplishment unravel the mystery of the runes. Zero to hero's work, cut the knot after another attack monsters, explore the runes, have planted a variety of traps and mystery. Honestly, that probably sounds a little more accurate to my experience with the game. So, yeah, from what I gather, the main character is either a soldier or mercenary who, along with other members, need to explore these rooms. Gameplay is entirely solo, but allies will pop in from time to time during missions to offer advice, advance the story, or give you some useful items. The rooms themselves act as this game's central location, but the game itself is actually broken up into individual levels that take place within and around the rooms. While in the rooms, you will solve puzzles, platform, dodge traps and hazards, and fight plenty and plenty of enemies. It really does share a lot of elements with Tomb Raider, and the somewhat awkward controls certainly harken back to that too. Your main character movement is much smoother and precise than Tank Lara, that's for sure. But as soon as you try to perform additional movements like crouching, platforming, or entering combat, you'll soon find Blade Arts has a nice dose of that PS1 roughness we all know and love. A lot of the commands in this game require usage of both the shoulder buttons and the face buttons to execute things properly, and it often involves a lot of stopping and starting before you remember how to double tap and hold the circle button to crouch, and then press forward and or one to roll under this gate. Now, you may be wondering how I would even figure that out, and honestly, I probably wouldn't if the game didn't have a bunch of tutorial tips. Now, once again, these feature no English whatsoever, but the button commands always relate to something you're near, so I figure from the buttons that show up in the tutorial and the gap that's beside me, this is probably how I crouch. 
Similarly enough, when more tutorials pop up, I also figured out how to climb up walls, I figured out how to push blocks, how to use items, how to blow stuff up, etc. And this goes into fighting as well. This game really has as much of a focus on combat as it does on exploration. And I mean, the game is called Blade Arts after all, so you'd only expect to get a big ass sword at some point, right? And combat, thankfully, is pretty cool. The combat can be initiated by pressing R2 and will immediately lock you onto the nearest enemy. Movement commands change in this mode, allowing for a more mobile fighting game style with dodges and flips as well as letting you dish out sword combos in almost any direction depending on the angle that you're pointing your analog stick. Depending on the buttons held and your movement, it can change up your moves too. Now there's not a huge amount on offer from what I've played, but it does give you a nice set of options for enemies and honestly it's quite a lot of fun. You'll want to get used to managing your positioning as well as mastering blocks and dodges, but it is a cool combat system and definitely one of the more unique ones on the console. Thankfully blades aren't your only option though. Throughout the game you can also collect magic which gives you access to powerful ranged attacks. And magic can be leveled up to using items that drop from enemies. Do you want to put your nervous points into dignity, virtue or influence? Honestly I could probably use all the dignity I can get. So yeah, the core of this game is exploration, platforming, fighting lots of baddies and solving some puzzles along the way. It genuinely is a lot of fun. At least it would be if I had any idea what I was doing. Okay, so the gameplay also features quite a lot of Japanese dialogue and text. And like I alluded to earlier, you can probably fumble your way through most of it just noting the commands that appear on screen. But many, many, many times I also got stuck at dead ends. Now this usually led to me running around in circles, checking pretty much every area I could, searching for key items I may have missed or interacted with wrong, and honestly most of the time, after 5 or 10 minutes of trial and error, I could usually move forward a little bit again. But it was never too long until I found myself getting stuck once again. And then again. And then again. Until eventually I spent half an hour running around an entire level just unable to figure out what to do. And given how obtuse some of the game's commands are to figure out, it's possible I might never look into figuring out what to do. So this is the first time in this series that I actually had to give up on a game around 3 levels into it. Which is a shame because from what I got to play of this game, it has a ton of potential. The exploration is fun, it has a unique combat system and a ton of voice dialogue and story scenes. And some really, really cool boss fights as well. The language barrier unfortunately was just a bit too much for me to overcome without a guide. Which of course does not exist, so I'm out of luck. I really wanted to check out more of this game, I'm aware that it has additional weapons that you can use, other magic types, obviously extra enemies and bosses, but even with a bare amount of searching, I just couldn't find any footage of this game beyond the first level, at least on YouTube and general websites anyway. So I can't even give you a glimpse of what it's like, it's just, it's just a mystery. Now for something I didn't get to play that much, I'm probably being a bit too nice to it, and in fairness, the game is not perfect. I mean, for a 2000s game, the graphics and characters can look a little rough. There's lots of jaggies, and there's some draw distance limitations about as well. And the music is... it's fine. The loops are very short and can definitely wear thin when you're listening to them for 40 minutes straight per level. The boss music on the other hand is pretty cool though, even if it just kind of awkwardly fades away and comes back in during the fight. I will say, in spite of a little jankiness and some visual and audio issues, I did really enjoy what I played here. It feels like a very substantial game that a lot of effort was put into. I'm sure this likely would have been a game that people would really enjoy if it had it came out in the West, but due to the cost of translating it and the fact that it would have been at least 2001 before it launched here, which was, you know, right in the middle of a generational transition, well, I'm not surprised it never came out. Still, if a guide or translation ever did become available, I'd be happy to try this game again in an instant. At the very least, it was fun exploring this relatively unknown game. It sucks that I can't really give a fair opinion on it, but maybe if you at home like the look of it and want to try your look, hopefully you'll get further than me. Or maybe you can read Japanese and have already tried it. If you have, please let me know in the comments. I would really like to learn more about this game if anybody has anything to share. Like, are there more helicopters that I can blow up at magic? Are there any more talking animals? Who the hell are these guys? Or this guy? Or that guy? Eh, who knows? Maybe one day we'll find out. And 
with that, we've reached the end of the road for Volume 3. We got to check out a weird parody shoot 'em up an even weirder puzzle game, and a promising action-adventure title that lets you attack talking panthers. But before we finish though, at the end of each episode, I like to slot each of the games into a tier. Is the game a must play? Is it worth trying if you like the look of it? Is the game trash and not worth your time? Or did I hit a brick wall and found the game unplayable due to the language barrier? Today sees two entries in the Troy tier, with Blade Arts being the debut entry into the dreaded No Gaijin tier. The game Paradise 2 has such a fun and cool concept that creates for some great environments and enemies, but the very short levels and lackluster gameplay just hold the game back from being anything more than a cute novelty in my eyes, especially when its predecessor is easier to get your hands on and just a much better game overall. And Gacho is really weird and absolutely may not be to everybody's taste, but there is a fun and challenging puzzle game beneath all the butts and armpit monsters. Nothing groundbreaking here, but if you do like brain teasers, I'd recommend giving this one a try for sure. And Blade Arts, look, I thought this game was really cool, it's a little rough around the edges, the combat and platforming can take a while to get used to, but it's got some cool bosses, some fun exploration, cinematic story segments with voice acting, this feels like a substantial game, and the problem is, I just wish I could play more of it. Now I'm not fully saying that the language barrier will stop you progressing in the game entirely, you could very likely navigate your way around through this game with a little more patience than myself. But for me at least, I found roadblocks to be pretty frequent and eventually enough to leave me completely stumped on how to continue. Hopefully in the future we might see a translation, a guide, or even just a full playthrough of the game online, which maybe there already is. I couldn't find one, but if somebody ever does, help your boy out and share it in the comments please. But for now, I haven't been able to play enough of it to be able to give a honest critique. It has a lot of potential and I would recommend trying it out if it seems like a kind of thing. Just be aware of the roadblocks that may lie ahead for you. So let me know, have you tried any of these games yourself? Are there any Japanese exclusive games that you'd like to see show up on the series? Drop a comment below, I always love reading through people's recommendations, so keep them coming. Anyway, as always, a big thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, a like and subscribe is always very much appreciated. You can check out plenty more PS1 content over on the channel in the meantime, including Volume 1 and 2 of this series, and my obscure and forgotten PS1 game series, which is more or less the same format if you crave a bit more random wheel action. Actually, we've reached Volume 3 for both series now, so from here on out, I'm just gonna alternate a little bit between the two, depending on, uh, certain factors.